All right, folks, if I could call you back to your seats, we're going to continue along with the next portion of our presentation. Just before the break, you may have heard me say, well, first of all, I'll have you know that a number of the groundwater professionals in this room have just mentioned that we're all going to need to go home and practice word transmissivity over and over again to make sure that we don't have 14 slips um, in our professions. <laughs> Folks, if I could ask you to take these conversations outside, that'd be fantastic. If you remember right before the break, I mentioned to you that in looking at the um, schedule that you have in front of you, that there's kind of a curriculum uh, there that was really well thought out. And, and if you think of a triangle, um, we started at the top and we're working towards a wider base there. And, and, and the reason why I'm putting that out there is that the MAG is a production of the DSC, which is this next presentation that we're going to have, which is a production of the GMA process, which is the presentation you'll have after lunch. And then that's all a result of the district activities, which are the presentations after that, right? So if you think about the decision-making process that leads to the groundwater availability models and the subsequent management decisions that are made from it, this, cur this curriculum that has been presented to you today is kind of a really nice um, linear uh, kind of curriculum on how it is that all of those decisions get made, right? And so I encourage you to think about it that way as we move forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker to you today. Um, Larry French is the director of the Groundwater Division at the Texas Water Development Board. His staff are the ones that conduct basic research and monitoring of the characteristics and conditions of the state's aquifers. They're the ones that we submit our DFCs to and then kind of run it through the, the modeling and produce the mag. Um, and he's the one that I always turn to when I have questions about what does that really mean? <laughs> What's changing um, as the legislature is deciding to change the process for the hundredth time in the past two years? Um, well, how is that all going to affect us? And so with that, let's welcome Larry French to tell us a little bit about DFCs, what they are, and how they impact us. Welcome, Larry. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Appreciate that uh, introduction. And uh, we'll continue on looking at another piece of the uh, groundwater management puzzle, the desired future conditions. Uh, and you know, this is, this is, if you look around the country, uh, you'll find groundwater is managed in many different ways. There's, there's two fundamentally different approaches to managing groundwater. And in Texas, uh, groundwater, and I'm not going to get too much into the legal aspect, but groundwater is uh, owned by the surface owners, the landowner. Uh, it's a private property right, and that's, that's been a lot of discussion, of course, uh, uh, throughout the years uh, by our policymakers and so forth. If you go to other states, um, let's say other western states, particularly let's say New Mexico or Colorado, you'll find that groundwater is not owned by the surface water owner, it's I mean, by the uh, landowner, it's owned by the state. And so the management of that resource is done completely differently. So uh, it's interesting as you look across the country, the different styles, the different approaches. Texas were pretty unique, although other states where groundwater is also a private property right, such as California, uh, they're also struggling or, or trying to figure out exactly how to do it. And we've been interested to see that some of these other states, like California, have actually been uh, looking at us as a, as a model. Uh, now, we're, not, we're, we're still ironing out details, and, and uh, there's a lot of debate that goes on, but it's interesting to see how other states and other areas are approaching groundwater management. Okay, so we'll talk about uh, desired future conditions and what that means. Let's see, I'm not sure we're ready. Okay, good. Just as a preview, what I'm intending to cover in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, really let's define what the desired future conditions are, how, what, they, what they consist of, how they're expressed. I'll uh, we'll talk also, um, how do they come about? How are they developed? How are they defined? Uh, who does it? Um, and what kind of input do you have in that process? Uh, and why are they important? How are they used? Uh, what kind of effect does it have on you as a groundwater producer or for the landowner? Uh, or someone interested in the resource. Uh, so we'll cover uh, those basic topics, hopefully. And if, uh, if I don't, if you feel I did, you can certainly ask me about it. Okay, well, you'll see this is the first of a series of slides that I've completely stolen from uh, my boss, Robert Mace. So uh, thank you, Robert, for introducing them. Uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, when we talk about desired future conditions, you'll hear the term, it's in the law, called relevant aquifers. And at the board, we have defined relevant aquifers as major or minor aquifers. Robert explained what those are. Uh, 
Uh, as you know, the uh, crease of Wilcox here is this red zone. If, you, if you're uh, standing on that part of the crease of Wilcox, it's that solid red. It's actually at your feet. Uh, it's it's uh, outcropping at the surface. The hatchard area is where it is uh, dipping down and is buried underneath the uh, uh, rocks uh, above it. Uh, these lines here, you see, this is the where we define at the end of these hatchard lines in several areas. Uh, the rocks continue on deeper than that. The rocks keep going, but we have defined the edge of the aquifer based on water quality, typically about 3,000 milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids. So the aquifer continues on, but no one use it typically. We're looking at freshwater aquifers here. If you get, this is a, a, a rabbit trail here a little bit. If, if you get into the area of brackish groundwater, which is a uh, very much a hot topic these days, there's a lot of interest and in energy being uh, looked, uh, being poured into the uh, brackish resources, you'd be going beyond those hatchet lines, basically, deeper. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, minor aquifers. Uh, these are the smaller in area or smaller in water. Uh, the Queen City Sparta, Yedwood Jackson. Also, another uh, aquifer that's important here locally, of course, is the Brazos River Alluvium. Uh, we have developed groundwater model uh, availability models on all of these aquifers, except for, well, there's a couple that are still under development, but just a couple of the minor ones we have not done yet. Thinking particularly out in West Texas, the Marathon Aquifer, we haven't tackled that one yet. But by and large, we've, uh, over the space of about 15 plus years, uh, we have either at the board or through contracting with uh, uh, qualified uh, engineering and geologic uh, consulting firms have developed uh, groundwater models for uh, all, just about all of these aquifers. In some cases, we're on the third or fourth generation. Okay, some of you may have seen this. This is our uh, equation of groundwater availability. And basically, in, uh, it, the way we handle groundwater availability in the state in terms of defining it is a mixture of what we call policy and science. Now, Robert talked about science here in, uh, in the past hour or so. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically, when you're looking at the policy, that's what we're, what we'll be talking about today at least in this session, the desired future conditions. And we match that with uh, the tools, the GAMs that, that Robert talked about, and we blend those together, and we get this concept called modeled available groundwater, uh, which I'll define in a little more detail in just a few minutes. But the whole process is really intended to provide a basis to make sound decisions on groundwater availability. Um, there's a lot that goes into that, and it's very regional in nature. The, the issues that are um, important and relevant to this audience here in the Carrizo Wilcox in Central Texas, you're going to find a completely different um, perspective, uh, different, different uh, types of aquifers, maybe different um, water uses in perhaps the high plains or the hill country. So it really is a very important to consider as you look at the desire if you can do future conditions, looking at a lot of the local, local uh, concerns. Well, it hasn't always been this way. Uh, we've had desired future conditions with us for uh, a little over 10 years. I believe it was in 2005 the legislature basically embarked us on this, this pathway of, of, uh, of more of a local, locally based, locally derived groundwater management policy. But if you go back 20 years ago, uh, what we call the old school groundwater availability approach, uh, groundwater availability was pretty much uh, uh, determined in Austin, in our offices, uh, where we have uh, very capable geologists and engineers who would look at maps, look at water levels, look at aquifer properties, the properties of kind of things that uh, Robert was mentioning, and they'd develop maps, they'd outline uh, zones that would be preferential for groundwater development based on the properties, but it was with very little, not the little input from local areas in terms of what their uses and needs were. Uh, and, and so these, these water availability approaches, certainly valid from a technical standpoint, but didn't have any real policy component in them. And that all changed about 20 years ago when, when the whole state water planning process was converted from kind of a centralized uh, uh, 
Austin-driven approach to more regional, local-driven approach that, that was dealt with uh, both on surface water and then a little bit later with groundwater in the desired future condition uh, process. So that process turned into something we call joint planning. And that is a basically where groundwater conservation districts in a groundwater management area, and I'll define these in just a second, but basically meet at least once a year. And I can tell you groundwater management, the local groundwater management area here has been meeting much more frequently than that as they're, they've been deliberating on, on their desired future conditions. But they're, they're there to compare really how they manage a common resource. Uh, the, uh, as, you, as you'd be aware, certainly from Robert's presentation of just how things work, uh, groundwater uh, could care less about county lines, could care less about state lines or any kind of other political lines. And so there's a realization, even though that, that many of our groundwater conservation districts have political boundaries out of necessity, uh, it's important for groundwater conservation districts to come together and see how their individual decisions are affecting the aquifer as a whole, because what one district does can certainly affect an adjacent district or down dip district or what have you. So it was a, the idea was basically bring uh, districts together to compare what their planning approaches were, uh, what their data are, and so forth. So groundwater joint planning was basically the, the vehicle to uh, initiate a lot of these uh, discussions. This is a map that shows the groundwater management areas in the state. The highlighted area is groundwater management area 12, or we call them GMAs for short. Um, the, if I were to overlay a, uh, the major aquifer map of the state on this, uh, on this map, you'd see that these boundary lines roughly coincide to the GMA lines. And that's a reflection because we want these GMAs basically to uh, reflect common aquifer uh, characteristics and locations. So each of these uh, 16 groundwater management areas and districts within those uh, areas come together at least once a year and they plan and they develop ground, uh, excuse me, uh, desired future conditions. There's one exception to that. If you look uh, way out in El Paso, uh, GMA 5, uh, there aren't any districts in that uh, groundwater management area, so that's the only groundwater management area that doesn't have any desired future conditions. There are no districts there. So, just one, one little uh, trivia part. So, desired future conditions, what is it? Um, that's the textbook definition, but it basically answers the question, what do you want your aquifer to look like in the future? And uh, so, so that's a policy decision. It's, it's a decision that comes together involving a lot of different things. Uh, it's for what we call the relevant aquifers, major and minor aquifers. There can be some exceptions, but generally it's, it's those aquifers. And it's a broad policy goal. Um, how is it expressed? Typically, and certainly in this area, the desired future condition is usually expressed in water levels or drawdowns. A drawdown being basically a the change in water level elevation uh, from some sort of baseline condition, usually the most recent water level data. Uh, in some areas, like in the hill country, uh, you may find desired future conditions expressed as a spring flow. For example, they want a spring to flow at a certain cubic feet per second in, in certain conditions, like a drought condition. And so that, that would be the, the condition of the aquifer that is desired to be over time. Uh, in some areas, like pretty, pretty, pretty much in the Ogallala, the uh, storage volume has been a common way to express a desired future condition. Uh, for example, uh, in the Ogallala, a the GMA may express its desired future condition as being, we want a certain percentage, volume percentage of groundwater remaining in the aquifer over a certain time period. And typically we use about a 50 year horizon. It's a long time, but it, but it provides basis for, for future planning. So there are, many, there are different ways that that can be expressed. I'd say drawdown is the most common in the state. It, it can certainly be possible to use water quality. Uh, as an example, you might want to maintain a certain water quality in an aquifer. Uh, we have seen um, 
in this last round of desired future conditions, a DFC express as subsidence, uh, that being uh, uh, certain area in the, in the Houston area wanted to express their desired future conditions. We, we don't want to have more than a certain amount of land subsidence uh, over a certain period of time. So, of course, that, that, that gets complicated, as you can imagine. How do you translate that into, how do you manage the resource to accomplish that goal? Uh, and these desired future conditions are dynamic. Uh, once they're set, they're not set in stone. Uh, there's a, a mandatory, basically, and the, the legislature, I think every time they meet, they, they, we, they have a, uh, a they, they've, uh, uh, change the date just slightly for various things, and it was changed this past session uh, so that the next proposal for the desired future conditions will be due in, uh, I believe it's May 2021, and then the final adoption, I'll go through this process in a minute, will be in January 2022. It's basically been a five-year process. We have just completed or just completing the second of the five-year cycle. So for most uh, areas, there's just one exception. Uh, there have been, uh, we're on the second generation of desired future conditions. So here's a little bit about the process and, and uh, don't be too, too scared off by a chart like this. There are three main, main groups here that are involved with the process. First of all, in red, the uh, district representatives in the groundwater management area. These are groundwater conservation districts by law. The, and that's, who are these people? Most, uh, most of these district representatives are the general managers of the uh, districts. It can be a board member, sometimes a board president, maybe serve as that, in that role, and may exchange roles, but basically a dis district representative. Then the next group are individual districts, so that would be the actual district itself, rather than a representative meeting in a groundwater management area. This goes back to the local district including the board and the citizens within that district. And then the other player in this process would be us, the Water Development Board. So how does this work? Basically, up in the top left corner there, um, district representatives, uh, as indicated in red, will meet, and they're going to review uh, really what the conditions are, uh, their aquifer conditions are in their areas. So that can, can be anything from looking at the latest uh, monitoring data that have been gathered over time. They can be looking at, uh, are there any updates to the groundwater availability models? Are there any changes in laws that affect things? So, so basically they're reviewing their conditions. And as they discuss those, and I'll, I'll go through some of the factors that they, they're required to look at, they'll eventually identify and then propose, and vote to propose, uh, desired future conditions. These are like, you might consider them like draft desired future conditions. So once they vote on those, and the, the next time that will happen, or the deadline for that will be in 2021, uh, they then take those, those uh, uh, draft conditions, and then they go to the individual districts where uh, people in the district will have an opportunity to look uh, at those proposed desired future conditions. They'll be able to look at the basis for those conditions, and they'll be able to make comments, and they'll hear from in a public setting, uh, the, uh, how those uh, DFCs were developed. Uh, the district representatives will, will take those comments if necessary. They'll make any revisions to the uh, desired future conditions. And at this stage, they'll vote to adopt the desired future condition, which is kind of the, the final. It's a set of the draft is basically the final. So those desired future conditions, which are expressed typically, let's say, in GMA 12 here, they would be expressed as so many feet of drawdown in certain areas, in certain aquifers, or certain subdivisions of aquifers. They uh, then prepare uh, and produce a report that they give to the Water Development Board called an explanatory report. And that explains and basically lays out uh, uh, in a report format all the justification, all the rationale, all the background information that went into developing the desired future conditions. And then individual districts um, will then adopt the desired future condition that applies specifically to their district. So it's really, you can almost imagine this is like a tennis match. You know, uh, one, one, one 
party is, is developing, and they serve over a draft condition that gets commented on, and then, they, then those comments go back. And so it's, it's sort of a back and forth process. There's plenty of public interaction that goes on. Um, we've seen in the second cycle a lot more public interaction, I think, than maybe the first was when it was brand new program. So that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the uh, kind of the sausage making of this this whole thing is how the process is. So what are the factors? What what are the factors? What are the conditions that are uh, are required to be evaluated uh, by district representatives when they look at their offer? Well, they have to look at um, and this is all in state law. They have to look at the uses and conditions of the aquifer. So, like Robert mentions, the basic physical properties of the aquifers are important. Uh, the water levels, the um, flow paths, the relationships of one aquifer to another would be part of that. The uses, you know, who's using, how much usage, what kind of, of uh, demand is there on the aquifer. Uh, they also are required to look at the state water plan, the document that basically uh, puts together the for the whole state the various uh, strategies, the demands, the strategies, the needs for water. They have to consider these things as part of their uh, development of the desired future conditions for their area. Uh, hydrologic conditions, it's very similar to the uses and conditions. Uh, environmental impacts, and that can be a wide-ranging uh, set of things. In many cases, uh, that may be uh, what are the impacts of various uh, potential desired future conditions on um, maybe a critical habitat related to sp maintaining spring flow. That may be an example of one that has been in some areas. Um, and that, that gets into the question of groundwater and surface water relationships, which is a very important consideration. And like Robert has mentioned, he was mentioned earlier, the, uh, the local model for this area is being uh, revamped to improve that, uh, that uh, the way the model deals with those kinds of impacts. Uh, land subsidence in certain areas, so if you go to the Houston area, that's a very important uh, factor. Many parts of the state, not as much, but it's a, it's a factor that needs to be looked at. And then I just will group these other, other ones here, kind of the more of the policy-oriented factors that need to be looked at. Uh, the representatives must consider socioeconomic impacts of various desired future conditions. Private property rights impacts. The feasibility, can these DFCs be achieved? Uh, what are the factors that may uh, impede the progress of, of achieving them? Are the factors outside the district? And of course, just, just in case uh, you forget anything, anything else that, that, that comes to mind. Uh, the last four there are, turn out to be, you know, they're not so technical, they're not so data-driven. Uh, they're, they're fairly challenging to, to uh, I think all the GMAs within the state are, are uh, uh, you know, approach these last four factors a little bit differently. Uh, but they uh, they're, uh, provide a lot of interesting discussion. I'll, I'll look into that. Okay, and so then, if that wasn't enough, the uh, district representatives are also well, required in what we call the balancing act. Uh, and they, they need to look at their desired future conditions and balance uh, one side the highest practicable amount of groundwater production that can be achieved, but on the other side, they need to conserve, preserve, protect. Uh, prevent waste and control, control subsidence. So there's this balancing act. They have to do kind of both. They are not easily balanced. And so trying to find that, that balance between the two is certainly a challenge, but that is required to do. And they address that in terms of in their explanatory reports that we, we look at. There's another factor that I think Robert mentioned in, in terms of what the models can do is this is a, was a relatively recent, uh, in the last couple of years actually, Another factor that uh, districts need to look at when they define the DFCs, and that's something called the total estimated recoverable storage. I put the definition up there, but basically it, it deals with the, uh, and this, this is a number that the Water Development Board has prepared and then, then provided to all of the GMAs. It just basically answers the question, how much water is there physically? How much water is in the bathtub, if you will? Um, it does not address, there's, we need to apply some caution to that, it doesn't uh, address the economics of trying to get that water out, it doesn't address any kind of consequences that, that may be experienced as a result of pulling that water out. 
So, uh, so if you pull all that water out and the land sinks, uh, you know, 50 feet, you know, we don't we don't address that. Uh, or if you uh, pull all that water out and, and basically salt water flows in to replace it, that's not something we address either. But so it basically just gives uh, the decision makers an understanding how much water's there. Uh, and usually these numbers are huge, they're huge numbers, because these are uh, many of the aquifers, like the Crees of Wilcox is a thick, very productive, uh, let me say the word transmissive, <laughs> Trans <laughs> transmissive aquifer. Uh, so those are big numbers. Uh, I really hesitate at putting a table like this up, but this is, these are the, the uh, total estimated recoverable storage for all of the uh, GMA-12. This column here, and it's by county, lists the numbers in acre feet. And if you add up all the the uh, the uh, storage numbers in the Carrizo Wilcox for those counties in uh, GMA 12, uh, you come up with a little over a billion acre feet. Uh, well, that sounds pretty good, having all that water. But again, there's no there's no judgment of these numbers, no no policy judgment. It's just a, just how much water is there. Uh, doesn't mean that you could recover it, and even if you could, doesn't tell you uh, if something bad could happen if you did. So now it leads us to really what the last part of that equation dealing with the uh, modeled available groundwater. This is the number that the Water Development Board calculates based on the desired future condition that has been uh, debated and generated uh, from the, the local areas, the, the groundwater management areas. Then we take that number, and, and that number could be anything like, uh, let's say 300 feet of drawdown in the Simsboro in this county or 50 feet in the uh, Sparta in that county. We take those numbers and put them in our computers uh, that Robert Mace described, run them out, and then we develop what's called the model of available groundwater, which is basically how much water could be pumped or withdrawn from an aquifer that would achieve that desired future condition. So it's gonna be a rate, basically, um, usually an acre feet per year, and it's going to be a number that's, that's very much smaller than the, uh, the numbers that, that people would have seen for storage. So that, that turns out to be a very important number, a little bit available groundwater, because it then goes back into the, the plans that the groundwater conservation districts uh, use in terms of, of planning their resource. It feeds directly into the state water plan now. This has been a fairly recent development. So it becomes a fairly, it becomes a significant number. It also, when it goes into the state water plan, it also becomes um, important in terms of, of uh, those uh, projects that may want to receive uh, funding uh, from the Water Development Board to, uh, to get off the ground. So it, it becomes a fairly significant concept, all going back to the desired future condition. Okay, here's a, here's a, when, and this is from the, uh, the first cycle. These numbers are a few years old. But if you look on the left side, if you added up all of the, the model available groundwater throughout the state and you looked at each decade, you would see that every year that model available groundwater goes down. And that's basically a function of, it's driven primarily by the declining storage volume in the Ogallala Aquifer. As Robert mentioned, 40% of all the water in the state comes from that one aquifer, so it dominates the groundwater conditions. If you look at this pipe chart, which shows all uh, 16 uh, GMAs, these two big, over half of the uh, model available groundwater is from GMA 1 and 2. That's the high plains, the Ogallala. So all those other little slivers, uh, you're in here someplace. Let's see. Maybe this one here it is GMA 12, I'm not sure. But uh, you can see who, who dominates in terms of the overall model available groundwater in, this, in the state. So we talked about um, what G, uh, model available groundwater is. Now, how does that apply to the districts? Now, the districts, in terms of their operations, uh, they have kind of a uh, I won't say conflicting, but they, they have to do a lot of balancing acts themselves because the law says to the extent possible, um, they can issue permits up to the point of the exempt and permitted groundwater production that would achieve the applicable desired future conditions. So that's like the bag. But there's 
the weight. There's also some other factors that need to be applied there also. Because really, the districts are held, in terms of their management of the resource, to achieving a desired future condition. The MAG is a guide, basically. It's not an absolute, because it's, it's developed from the DFC, but it's, it's a modeled number. Okay? So they're really looking pretty much at uh, groundwater production. So when the, when the district is looking at managing uh, their resource, they're looking at the modeled available groundwater, they're looking at, at what groundwater has been produced under various except, exemptions, um, how much water has been permitted. Uh, there's a big difference between how what, what's permitted and what actually is produced. Many times the permitted numbers are, are typically much higher than what's actually produced. Uh, and then you're going to have fluctuations. If you look at uh, groundwater usage data, uh, you will see that um, uh, because of yearly rainfall, different uh, other conditions, when it rains a lot, people don't pump water so much. Uh, so there's a lot of production patterns that, that need to be considered. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex and uh, involved process for districts to use, uh, to, to make their permitting and resource decisions. Model available groundwater is a part of that, but not the only part. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here just with a little local uh, flavor. Uh, this is your area here in groundwater management uh, area 12. There are five districts um, that, and they're outlined here. Uh, this is a map of the uh, Crees of Wilcox. Again, the, the bright red area is where the Crees of Wilcox uh, crops out of the surface. You can actually stand on it. Uh, the hatchet area is where it uh, dips below the ground. Now, if you look at this blue line, this cross section, you'd see something like this. You can see that actually the aquifer from the outcrop, as it dives down below ground, it, uh, it's sloping and it also tends, tends to thicken uh, when, as you get deeper. So it gets thicker. Um, and also in the blue area shaded here, it's, it's just kind of a cartoon approach of showing where probably the fresh water is. But it, it actually gets. Uh, you know, we like to draw simple pictures like this, but if you saw the actual data like many of our modelers do or the technical consultants that might be here, you, know, you would understand that the, uh, the aquifer is much more complicated both in terms of its geometry and in terms of really its properties than, than what we portray in something simple like this. So this, this table compares uh, the modeled available, uh, or actually this is a, a table that shows the desired future conditions from the very first round uh, of, of uh, the very first cycle that was done in this most recent cycle. So Simsboro is a very uh, interesting one here. So if you look at on the rows, describe the various uh, groundwater conservation districts. So for example, we'll pick on Brazos Valley here. In 2010, the DFC was 270 feet of drawdown in the uh, Simsboro. Uh, it was adjusted somewhat to be 295 in uh, 2017. Uh, in Lost Pines, it changed just slightly, just a few feet. Changed a bit more in mid, mid East Texas and a little bit more in Post Oak Savannah. Some of the districts um, for other aquifers may have changed it the other way. These are all based on, uh, again, reevaluating the groundwater use patterns, the uh, available data, uh, experience with what they've had and running those through some of the, the uh, looking at some of the models. Now these look like really exact numbers, but it's important to realize that there are some uh, what we call tolerance criteria. And just that's just recognizing the fact that these numbers uh, are, uh, you know, that this it's not an exact science and that there has to be a little bit of leeway. So we usually apply some percentage of plus or minus to some of these numbers. So I've listed those there. Uh, and again, that, a lot of that's a reflection of because some of these uh, numbers, uh, particularly when we get the model available groundwater, they tend to be uh, in the, they're, they're model numbers, so we understand that uh, there's some uh, approximate uh, nature to some of the, the numbers as well. Uh, I'm just going to skip this one. This is a, a, a map that was prepared by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, using our data at the Water Development Board, comparing um, within the Carrizo Wilcox throughout the state, uh, 
what was the actual amount of groundwater pumped versus the model available groundwater that was set. So the deeper, darker colors represent uh, areas of counties where there was groundwater production was exceeding the model available groundwater. All the other areas, the lighter colors, are where it was um, the actual production that was experienced, I think it's in 2010, was uh, much less than the model available groundwater. So, for example, in Milan and Burleson counties, it looks like it was probably 20 to 25 percent uh, number. So, really, that means the groundwater uh, production was much less than the model available groundwater in those areas. If you look in certain areas on South Texas and a few other counties, they were pumping more, or at least they're pumping a lot. Uh, it was more equivalent to the, the mag. You'd see a lot more darker colors if you went up to the uh, Panhandle area. So the, the final step is really, once we've developed these policies, these policy-driven uh, desired future conditions, we've looked at the, what the science tells us on how much water can be pumped, uh, the real test is how do we monitor that? How do we tell whether we're uh, achieving or meeting those goals? Uh, this is a cross-section that's actually a little bit south of here uh, through Bastrop and Fayette County. I just put it up here so that, that, that really when you look at the aquifers, they're not all the same uh, geometry, they're not all the same thickness, uh, they vary, and so developing a monitoring program, a uh, sound science-based monitoring program is a very, very important aspect of this whole groundwater uh, management approach. So again, stealing s more slides from my boss, uh, if we looked at this cross-section hypothetically here, and before a desired future, con future condition was defined, you have your uh, unconfined and confined aquifer, and you have your water level uh, basically uh, from the confined aquifer, kind of a pressure level in the aquifer. So that's all well and good. Well, the district representatives got together, voted and adopted to uh, define a desired future condition. I just put hypothetically, let's say this red line is that new desired future condition. Basically, the statement was, uh, we can tolerate, uh, and based on what we see the future is, we will say the desired future condition will, will be here over 50 years. Uh, so, okay, well, then we'll see how it goes. So after they, uh, that's been adopted, moving along here, the uh, groundwater development meets the desired future conditions. So they do some monitoring, and over time, uh, we'll look, there have been some pumping going on here, and we see some uh, water levels that actually have gone below, and you might say, well, that looks like a violation of the desired future condition to have, to have the groundwater levels below that. But over here, it looks like they're uh, still above. So that becomes kind of a management decision for the district. Has that, uh, has that desired future condition been violated? Is that on the average, are you okay? So that, these are the kinds of things that, that uh, the district would have to look at. You would expect that most of these uh, desired future conditions are expressed in terms of averages over an entire either a county or a zone. So that gives some flexibility because you would expect that there's going to be different uh, conditions and different experiences. Um, you might have some pumping that would go below a desired future condition, but many other areas would not. So you, you look kind of on the average. So that's one scenario. And then you could have one where, well, you've got everywhere a uh, 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 water levels have fallen. The data show that the water levels have fallen below the desired future condition. So that may turn out to be a management uh, decision for the district on how to deal with that. So in conclusion, there's three points uh, just to remember. Uh, at least I'd like to drive home. Uh, desired future conditions are expression of the local uh, groundwater management. Uh, it's locally driven and uh, involves citizen participation. These DFCs aren't set in stone. They're, uh, there's a five-year uh, review cycle, basically, and they can be modified to, to, uh, to change uh, and adjust uh, according to improvements and what we understand about the aquifer. And then, uh, ultimately, districts are required to uh, manage the resource uh, based on their management practices to achieve the DFC. So those are the main things uh, I was hoping to present today. So thank you very much.
Yes, sir. Yes, Larry Bob now, the producer of Wilcox Aquifer, has a dry water availability model of 55,000 acres each per year, roughly. Blue Water 130 project is going to right now pumping about 5,000 acre feet per year. Mr. Ridge, when it starts production in 2021, will be pumping 50,000 acre feet. That right there will exceed the groundwater availability model. What happens then? Well, that becomes, yeah, so, so the scenario you're saying is what happens when uh, there are various projects in an area and the, uh, the, the permitted amounts, certainly. So it will be up to the groundwater district, and I'm, I'm going to, Gary, if you want to jump in here, but basically they'd be monitoring what, what the production is, the actual production as opposed to the the uh, permitted production. actual production, and then they would look at how is the aquifer actually responding? Is it responding in a way that the model predicted? There probably is going to be some differences, and so they would be looking at actually looking at at their groundwater monitoring network and the data uh, that are generated from that network to see if, if the DFC is, is is still holding up, or I mean, is the, the data still in, in compliance with that, or are there are there changes? And if so, then that would be you know, up to the district to make any management decisions on that point. Is that, is that it clear? Might be, it might be worth mentioning in terms of the statutory requirement is to um, be consistent with the DFC, not right. with that. Right. The, uh, the law does say, Sarah's a good reminder, the, uh, the law states that the districts are really held to uh, their performance standard is the DFC, not the model available groundwater. Model available groundwater, I think I mentioned, is one of the factors, excuse me, that's, that's used in that, but the actual uh, uh, standard that the districts must must adhere to is the desired future condition. So that that's that would be the ultimate test. Yes. Um, if you could maybe put back to where you have the chart of all of the DSCs for the GMA, you know, the districts are GMA. Um, I you know was trying to look at it. If I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, I'd like, first of all, am I reading correctly, and could you comment on this? What it looks like post has the greatest drawdown BFC for certainly the Sinsboro, um, not so the Carrizo, it looks like they just jumped ahead of us on the Carrizo, but we're, we're seeing, you also see very huge differences between what we're doing. So first of all, am I correct that post has the greatest drawdown BFC for Sinsboro? And could you comment about just the issues we face and, and what can be done about the fact that we have such different standards? And I know that this, this is a problem with groundwater law, but... Yeah, there's certainly, as you see from a table like this, there's there's uh, quite a lot of variation between districts and, and the same aquifer. The aquifer uh, across the area is going to change in characteristics and thickness and quality and so forth. And again, it becomes a, a question of the uh, lo local districts and looking at their data and so forth. It, it would be very unusual for districts, in fact, uh, very unusual for districts to look and, and have it identical. Many of the GMAs will, will adopt a GMA-wide average for an area, but that average is built out of a components, individual components that, that add up together. So I can't recall if GMA-12 was an average for the whole GMA. Some do, I guess Gary's saying no. So um, it's, it's a reflection of both the aquifer characteristics and, again, uh, policy decisions that are made by local districts that account for a lot of the variations that you're going to see. And if I may, um, the panel discussion that's going to happen after lunch is going to specifically address the differences between the individual districts, and it might further kind of illuminate exactly your, your great question. Are there any okay. other questions? All right, folks, let's give Larry a big applause.